the historical commission. And uh, for those of you who didn't just hear that, probably nobody, uh, the meeting is online and it's being recorded as we all know. Um, we always begin these meetings with uh, public comment. If any of the individuals in attendance who are not commissioners and um, have anything they would like to bring up um, that is not currently on our agenda, we'd be happy to uh, hear from you at this time. And if you do have something you'd like to offer, we would like you to please identify yourself and your address. Is there any? Yes, Claudia. Hi, I'm putting my hand down first. I have something hanging here. Uh, Claudia Lefko, 40 Valley Street. I'm here um, to ask for with an ask about the Barrett Group. I don't know when they're um, going to make their presentation to the city, but I feel like there's been very little chance for the public to weigh in on what's happening with the plan. I, you know, I've said this before. I think the the survey was flawed. There wasn't very much chance for. A, an exchange, like I went to one of the Zoom meetings, I submitted a question, no one ever responded to my question, they said they would get back to me. So it's just, I think, been a bit under the rug. And so I'm hoping that the Historic Commission, you all, might um, suggest that they would have a public forum where actually they would come and, and you would come and perhaps the planning, whomever would come, and the public would get to ask questions rather than hear a presentation, but sort of a chance for us to express our concerns, our interest in historical preservation in the city or whatever, just as a way to, to um, I think I would feel better and, and others in the city might feel better if we felt there was a, an additional outreach, not of a presentation, but before that something where we could actually add our input. So that is my first thing. And then my second thing, and I'll try to be quick, Ever since 107 William Street was, you know, demolished and the whole uh, struggle around it began, people in the neighborhood have continued looking at the neighborhood, at Montview Avenue, at the little neighborhood. And we've launched a project actually with Historic Northampton to document Montview. And of course, as we begin to do this, and we've been interviewing people and, and taking stock of the neighborhood, it becomes more and more clear that the neighborhood actually is historic even though we're not designated a historic district, that the house that was knocked down is indeed just a little old vernacular house that nobody really cared about but us, but it was actually part of the historical landscape. And so I, I'm saying all this because I think this idea of designating one house significant or not significant presents some problems. I mean, right now, as the city's trying to do um, infill in the urban areas, I think it becomes more important that we consider neighborhoods like a bigger picture rather than individual houses. Because if we were, say, at some future when this project of ours gets going, um, decide we might declare this or try to establish it as a, as a historic district, we would be it, we would be missing something that would be the house and the property at 107. So it's vacant now. Nothing has gone in there yet. But and I I don't think you can do anything about it now. But I'm just saying in the future, I'm wondering if this can't be part of the consideration when you're looking at individual properties or houses or churches or whatever and asking are they historically you know significant I know when they considered St. John Cantius it had to do with what it meant to the community and so I'm not sure that figures in with these little houses but at any rate that's my comment um, I really do hope you'll sponsor some public forum around the Barrett report thanks a lot Claudia, I'm going to be talking about that in just in a second. So Great. we'll end. Okay. Up, we'll hear the rest of public comment, and then I have a few words to say about that. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Claudia. We have uh, Janet Gross next, and I guess Janet, you don't need to tell us who you are because I just said your name. <laughs> okay, Janet Gross, 38 Round Hill Road, a property that abuts the development on Round Hill Road. You doubtless don't recall that the parking area to our north, not shielded from our view by a buffer, since the development didn't want one, 
and city council obliged by canceling the ordinance was to be for emergency use only. It is now used regularly by trucks from a bar or workers in a large bobcat parked for hours as they employ excessively loud, polluting, gas-driven mowers and blowers while sporting shirts proclaiming Round Hill, as if the development were a resort and the drumlin their own. A taller fence with a black interior film now surrounds the pickleball courts. There is no green barrier as required to reduce the noise of loud voices and ping pong balls on steroids. It was hoped the greenery would also reduce the noise of the compressor and condenser that constantly huff and whine when temperatures reach 60 degrees, not to mention the loud roar of the generator on Tuesday mornings. Then there are the noxious signs proclaiming keep out, though in more subdued language, not in keeping with historic district guidelines, though now labeled directional signs and under the jurisdiction of the building commission, commissioner who finds them too attractive to remove. And where are the address numbers? A large 54 on the former Skinner building is hardly in keeping with historic district guidelines and well above a driver's sight line. Standing on the street with binoculars, I can view a sign, same design as the noxious ones, proclaiming Coolidge House, 48 Round Hill Road, clearly invisible, invisible from the street. Admittedly, it took me too long to recognize the lack of address numbers at the development as I watched vehicles of all sizes to include ambulances drive up and down the hill through the Clark Drive, as well as back and forth on our own drive, seeking a location at the development. Contact the building commissioner, I was told. Contact the fire chief, said the building commissioner. This past Saturday, I mentioned the lack of address signs to the mailman. His response, we've been talking to the development about that for years. And two weeks ago, Having been alerted by a resident of the development that there would be more apartments built, I contacted the building commissioner. He said he knew nothing about that, had no records since the renovation of the boiler plant. But what about the demolition work going on in Coolidge, I asked. Shortly thereafter, a stop work order was issued. No permits had been sought and therefore no permits had been issued. Yes, at the very least, it makes one wonder who in fact runs Northampton. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Jackie? Hi there. Um, I'm, I'm, that's a hard act to follow. Uh, Janet's description of a very Kafka-esque nightmare on her street. Now, I'm going to shift gears. I wanted to support everything Claudia said, and I'm glad to know that we're going to learn more about the Barrett Planning Group shortly. Um, in the process of waiting for their report, I, over here in Bay State Village, we have been getting in touch with our history. Um, I've written a, a document about the Industrial Revolution period in Bay State that is been, has been accepted for the historic Northampton website. Tomorrow night, the, our village association is going to post a little slideshow presentation based on that which document, which came from our wall of history. Um, Betty, uh, Betty, Betty was very impressed with our wall of history. We have like um, grassroots folk history happening in Bay State. Our village association has existed for 50 years. I'm sorry, I just got to plug it. Um, one of the things we're talking about tomorrow night is creating more form Bs for uh, multiple scores of 19th century houses that haven't been documented. Um, we were going to make some of our own historical markers update our wall of history, which was a victim of COVID. And finally, we want to talk about neighborhood historic districts because that would serve 
space state interests better than local historic district status. And I want you all to think about what's happening in Bay State. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you, Jackie. Are there any other members of the public that have anything to say? All right, we will move on to the next item. And that is the chair's report. I have a couple things that I wanted to just share with the commission and the public. Um, the first is regarding the preservation plan. Um, the report out of the planning office is that the draft recommendations will be available in the next week or so, and they will be distributed for review. So that's some progress there. And then in answer, I think, Claudia, to your question, um, the planning department has been able to secure some additional funding and they are going to shift uh, the public engagement plan a bit on the preservation plan and hold two recommendations summary forums in lieu of the joint planning board, board historical commission meeting. Um, this will happen before the end of June. And I'm really encouraging um, the commissioners to attend, that would be Steve and Barbara and myself, to at least one or both of those. Um, we'll get more details about those uh, from Sarah and the other folks in the planning office is that that get to, that's gets developed. So there will be an opportunity to um, hear the recommendations in detail and then of course obviously comment on them. So uh, stay tuned for details on that. Um, and the second item I wanted to um, just share with folks, there was a meeting of the Western Massachusetts uh, Historical Commission Coalition, and that was last Wednesday, it was virtual. And this is just a, um, a loose coalition that's been put together under the leadership of Mass Historic and the regional planning agencies. And it was quite um, informative. You know, most of the commission members that attended were from small towns and um, they, we were able to hear about some of the activities that are going on. But one that I wanted to note was a project that's happening in Waitley. I don't know if any of you is, you're familiar with this, but um, the Historical Commission there created what's called a hidden history digital map. So it's available on the Historical Commission of Waitley's website. And they were able to map and then prepare narrative information about um, a lot of the different historic sites in town. And it's a great educational tool. So it's something that you know we, we might wanna think about for the future and uh, working with uh, Historic Northampton and the Forbes on. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, they probably will be having some other meetings coming up and just stay tuned um, for information about that. Cause it's a nice way to meet other uh, folks who are involved in the same things that we are. All right, um, we do have one set of minutes to approve tonight, and this was from, ooh, where are my minutes? Oh, it was the December meeting. December 19th, yes, here they are. Um, Barbara and Steve, did you have a chance to look at these? Um, I did, uh, they looked good to me. I noticed, I'm, I'm actually sort of, uh, I had noticed that the mentioning that we had discussed um, uh, wanting to start or give some preservation awards, so, which we haven't done a number of years. And I realize I've been remiss in reviving that spreadsheet, but I will put it on my own agenda and I hope to do that soon. But the minute seemed fine. Steve, any comments? No, I move that we approve the minutes from the December meeting. Okay. All right. Second that. Okay, great. All right. Any more discussion? We'll take a vote. Short roll call, Steve? Yes. Barbara? Yes. And Martha? Yes. You can okay. We have a public hearing tonight, and uh, this is a request for a local historic district certificate of appropriateness, excuse me, pursuant to section 195 of the Northampton Code. For proposed replacement of 19 win windows at 300 Elm Street, it's map ID 31A-082. Um, and I wanted to ask, um, is the applicant in attendance or representative? Yes, hi, uh, can you hear me? 
Yes, we can hear you. Hi, I'm Jess Brand, and I, I just wanted to mention that it's actually 10 windows. Uh, there are 19 windows being proposed for change, but there are 10 windows that are in way of public view. Okay. At least by my understanding of it. Okay, well, thank you for making that um, sure. uh, clarification. Uh, do you have, is there a presentation you would like to make to us, Jess? Would you like to, um, usually we have, you know, get some information from you, sort of have you speak and go through what uh, you're planning on doing. And I, but I also need to kind of go over with the commissioners how we go about this process and what we're going to be looking for. So um, if you're comfortable speaking now, we can do that afterwards. Sure. Yeah. Um, okay. I, I also have um, Peter from Millwork Masters here. Uh, he is um, going to be speaking on the window itself. Millwork Masters is a company out of New Hampshire that has a focus on historic preservation and replacement windows. Um, and I, first of all, I just want to say that um, I love my house and my goal for this project is to maintain the original historic aesthetic of the house and its windows. And I find that windows are usually a usually important part of the building. Um, my windows are single pane. They are original. They are beyond uh, repair at this point. There is cracks and holes in the, in the panes. There are cracks in the frames. Um, you might have seen in my window submission that we, a couple months ago, had an owl fly through one of the window panes in one of the apartments in my building. My building is a rental that I also live in. Um, the owl was unharmed, which is a testament to how thin the window pane is. Um, and really what I'm trying to do with this project is number one, um, fulfill my legal responsibility as a landlord to provide, um, a double pane window for my tenants. Uh, the energy code states that I have to either put on storm windows, which I don't have the funds for or single pane, uh, double pane windows. And I am going through Mass Saves heat loan and uh, taking out $25,000, hopefully, if this is approved, to uh, to update these windows to double pane um, in the high-end Marvin Elevate line, which is fiberglass clad with exterior simulated divided lights and um, I believe a spacer bar in, in between the panes as well. Peter is going to speak more to that. Unfortunately, this uh, heat loan does not allow for repair of existing windows. It only allows for replacement. Um, uh, let's see what else I wanted to bring up. Uh, currently, I uh, the windows are so thin that there's literally a six to eight degree difference between the windows, uh, the exterior wall, and the interior wall of the building. Because of that, we all have to put plastic on our windows. The plastic, it looks incredibly ugly and really takes away from the original aesthetic of the building and end of the windows. Um, what I'm proposing to do is to replace with windows that are look as in kind to what is there now, um, but without having to have plastic on them. Um, the house currently is not pure. We have vinyl windows in the basement. We also have vinyl windows on the third floor. Um, I think they look bad. I hope in the future to be able to replace them, if this is approved, to replace them with fiberglass clad windows with exterior simulated divided lights as well to uh, um, restore even further. We do have two windows. Uh, one is street facing and one is on the side. All of the windows specified are on the sides of the building. Um, but there is one on the side that I am trying to restore to its original aesthetic. It is um, currently a 12 over one uh, window and the window above it is 12 over two. So my uh, proposal and this window is going to be wood so that it can um, accommodate the 12 over two uh, look that's intended. So um, my my plan is to restore this window 
to the 12 over two that is of the window above it. And then on the street facing side, the only window that is street facing is also going to be wood high end Marvin signature ultimate line um, wood clad and that is going to also be restored to its original aesthetic of 12 over 2. Right now it's 12 over 1. At some point the lower pane was replaced and it was not replaced in kind with what was there and I really want to replace uh, the windows so that they can reflect the original integrity of what was intended for the building. Um, I also just want to bring up the fact that, you know, these are original windows and no window is going to last forever. Eventually, the materials break down as they have in my building. And um, I am lucky enough now to be able to have access to the Mass Save heat loan to replace my windows, which I believe was not possible before. And I don't know in the future if it will be possible to use the Mass Save heat loan to replace these windows. And I, so it's, it's incredibly important to take advantage of this opportunity. Um, I had mentioned as well in my submission that I've spoken with Mass Save. I've actually gotten an exemption from them. They require triple pane windows for their Mass Save heat loan. I've explained how difficult it's been to find triple pane windows that um, are affordable and meet the historic commission guidelines. And so they've given me ex an exemption to do double pane instead. Um, I, I don't know if anyone, if everyone has seen my submission, but other issues that uh, that are happening with my windows is there is extreme frosting happening on the inside uh, of the single pane. And um, plastic on the windows when there's any sort of draft, any wind, the plastic billows in and out on the inside of the window, which is really a testament to how much air leakage there is. Um, I also just want to bring up the um, I want to bring up the topic of repair. Um, these windows, uh, even with repair, uh, will not be as thermally efficient as double pane windows. They will not meet the energy code requirements, and the weighted windows, especially, have an an extreme amount of air leakage. Um, that will also prevent them from meeting the energy code. Um, and I and now I just want to I want to uh, hand it over to Peter, who's going to explain that, um, amongst other things, that the fiberglass clad windows look exactly like the wood windows. The exterior simulated divided lights that we are proposing um, actually allow for a greater uh, window uh, pane space and more light to enter the building. Um, but I, I'm not going to be as eloquent as a professional. So Peter, I'd, I'd like to hand it over to you. Um, and thank you very much for, for hearing me. Thank you, Jess. Yeah, um, Peter, before you begin, uh, either Sarah or Peter, would it be possible for you to uh, share with us the photographic documentation from the submittal? Sarah, can you do that? Do you want me to? Uh, I can do that. Just give me a minute to. Okay, sure. Yeah. So, Peter, you're welcome to go ahead. Okay. Well, Sarah's Thanks. queuing that up. Yep. So, basically, what I did um, is Jess had uh, asked my involvement um, actually on behest of one of my employees who's on vacation right now. So, wanted to jump in. So, um, I did put some together some drawings if anyone wanted to reference them to basically show how the window goes into the existing unit, the differential in terms of existing um, sash opening to visible glass dimension, um, any section details of the divided light to confirm that there's an internal space bar, et cetera, et cetera. As just alluded to, uh, Marvin has a number of different collections. We're using two different ones on her project, uh, basically to meet whatever the needs that they have. One of them uh, being with the um, the Queen Anne type of look that she has, a Victorian look where there was the 12 over two, we have to use our ultimate collection so that we can achieve the matching light as well as uh, the size requirements. And then the other was Elevate, um, which is the bulk of the project with those couple of exceptions. 
the way that I had explained it to Jess, easiest way when sometimes people are looking at, at the differences, I know when your specifications, uh, clad wood windows have been approved. Easiest way to understand it is with a clad wood window, um, wood really is a skeletal or structural component of the window. There's an extruded aluminum cladding applied to the outside that gives you a maintenance-free exterior with the Marvin collection, all that does. Um, they do have gone to great lengths to really try to match everything in terms of uh, historic detail with um, looking like old putty glazing, whatever the style and rail dimensions might be, etc. Um, the alter, or excuse me, the Elevate collection is a pultruded fiberglass um, exterior with a wood interior. The difference on that is that the pultruded fiberglass, referred to as Altrex, is actually what provides the skeleton or, or structure of the window. Wood is applied to the interior as a uh, decorative component. I did do a, um, like I said, I did put some drawings together, kind of show what the differences are, how they relate to what the existing daylight opening would be, um, divided light um, dimensions, et cetera. As Jess had also alluded, one of the things um, in terms of meet, meeting energy performance requirements, we do have to have insulated glass um, with a minimum of low E2, which is two coats of silver applied to surface number two, argon gas filled. Some requirements uh, want us to stretch uh, to improve the U value. All those things being equated to the other thing that Marvin does from a historical standpoint is that with their uh, low E coating is also, it's applied in a manner called sputter coating, which is a molecular, molecularly charged process, which bonds the coats of silver to that surface number two. So it gives you a more, uh, as close to neutral appearance in terms of uh, colorization, where you look at other manufacturers, they might have purples or blue hues to them. So it really tries, tries to keep in essence what you're looking for in your historic districts, um, as well as meeting the, re the performance requirements of that which is out there. Um, if, if you'd like, I. I'll put it out there if, if you wanted to see some details just to see how they how the two compare from a visible visible light standpoint. I did not have all of Jess's uh, details. As I said, I was a little late to the party. I took a historic, what historic dimensions typically are with the style and rail dimensions to say, here's what she has, here's what the new one would be. So you can kind of look at the two to compare if that is of help. That would be helpful. So if I can, can I, I'll share my screen for that. Sure. Yeah, should be awesome. So what we're looking at here is just some things that I've drawn. I'm just, uh, we'll finish the process there. Okay. So you should be able to see um, right now what I've drawn up in AutoCAD. And I will zoom in a little bit here. This is just looking at it in cross section. So what the top sash, what I envision her top rail dimension would be looking at the sash opening to the visible light, just this exterior part right here, just showing what that, your typical putty glazing would be on a single strength glass. I'm estimating that that is probably gonna be two and five sixteenths. It could be a little bit more, but I tried to take something uh, that I felt was probably appropriate for the age of the building, et cetera. On the bottom rail, um, I estimated that we would be looking at about four and three, four and five thirty seconds from visible glass down to the uh, what is referred to as a sash opening, which is just a little bit bigger than the actual bottom rail itself. If you look at the replacement elevation using one of the examples that she has, which is a two wide, one high light cut in both sash, I, I did to mention here what the visible glass would be in this replacement. Get that to zoom in a little. When the replacement window goes in, you can see that that we're basically putting a frame in a frame. So as as in so doing, you do lose a little bit of visible glass. But with the pultruded fiberglass, we can make the profiles much smaller to keep them as close to uh, original as possible. So in essence, if we've got Two and eleven thirty seconds from sash opening to visible glass. I estimated the original was two and five sixteen. So we're we're we have a difference of one and three thirty seconds. The bottom rail, even with the frame, I was actually able to make it a little bit smaller. So we're three and three and thirteen sixteenths versus the four and five thirty seconds. So the net effect should be 
pretty close to an equal visible glass dimension for what Jess currently has in place. Uh, I also dimensioned what the visible glass is from top sash to bottom sash um, on this new unit being two and 11 30 seconds. Sometimes um, historic commissions like to look at that dimension. Other times they are more interested in top and bottom rail dimensions. The styles, which are your vertical components here in the window, uh, that same that would be that same three and 11 30 seconds from sash opening to visible glass. I did not do that drawing um, for what I anticipated the original wood would be, but it's probably going to be relatively close to this same two and five sixteenths. The other one that I drew uh, that Jess had referred to was this larger window here, which is showing the, the Victorian light cut in the top sash, and then just the one vertical bar shown in the bottom. And Jess, I think in a test, I think in her, um, her submittal package, it is shown as I think a second floor window. First floor yes. was the one that had had originated or eliminated, excuse me, that bottom divided light, and we are putting that back in. With with this collection, we we actually space these dimensions here in this Victorian light cut, so the visible glass will match exactly what is there now, be it four inches, four and seven thirty seconds, whatever that dimension is we make it accordingly so that they do match all of uh, what is there and existing. This one here, as you can see, we looked at the other. It's very close, but it is actually a little bit bigger. We had in the Elevate collection, we were three and 11, 30 seconds. Here were three and 13, sec 30 seconds. And again, I'm just emphasizing this because I believe um, you're in your, um, application process, extra, um, a, aluminum clad replacements are approved. So I was actually trying to show that the fiberglass does increase our visible glass dimension just because we can make the profile slightly smaller. Check rail on this is a little bit different than the other, but the bottom rail, as you can see, is four and 11 sixteenths, where the other one was three and 13 sixteenths. In both cases, we have this so that the divided light bar, the simulated divided light, um, which gives the look of a historic authentic divided light, but the performance of an insulated glass unit is a bar width of seven eighths of an inch, both inside and outside. And then this, there's a, a stainless steel spacer bar in that airspace that when you're looking at the window straight on or from the side, it uh, makes it appear that divided, that divided light or light division, excuse me, is going from inside to outside. That's available in either a stainless steel finish or black. Uh, Jess and I did have a um, conversation off camera that that's one of those things where the black window, sometimes it even, if you, we did that spacer briar in black could actually enhance that to make it look even that much more authentic. So that's that's a pretty quick thumbnail sketch of, of some of the differences uh, b between the two, but some of the similarities also, and trying to do the things to meet the objectives of your, of your commissions, what they set forth. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, one other question, um, and Sarah, I, I'm going to ask you to put the uh, present, a submittal back up. I, I think it'd be, it's important for us to all see exactly which windows are being replaced on the house. I was actually hoping, could I share my submission and I can go through it and quickly just show you exactly what windows. Yeah, either one is fine. That would be okay, great. I do have it up. Let me let me quickly share, and then it'll it'll be a little easier. And also, just while you're pulling that up, um, just to point out to us, um, which of these windows are original to the late nineteenth century house uh, construction of this house, and which have been replaced? Because you indicate that some are. Uh, replacement windows that you're replacing some are original that you're replacing so I, I'm actually only replacing original um what I had meant by that was that in the future with if I have funds available I would like to replace the vinyl replacements with fiberglass that is closer to the original aesthetic with the similar elevate line um, but right now I'm focusing on the single pane windows um, because those really need to be replaced Okay, so they're all original that you're taking out. Yes, 
Yep. Okay. They're all original. Thank you for clarifying that. So um, can you see my screen? We can. Okay. So this is the owl that flew through the window. Um, this is one of the original windows. As you can see, um, it doesn't fully close. There's been wood um, put in to kind of keep it uh together so that it will will close um this is also happening on the inside i should have included some pictures of that but there's wood on either side on the interior of the windows to keep the glass pane from popping out um, in multiple windows uh, this is the extreme ice uh buildup um frost that is happening in the winter time on the interior of the of the window This is some of the damage to the window pane. Uh, not pictured here is a, another pane in actually my apartment that's sliced in half. Some damage to the frame. Damage to the frame. Frame damage. And then uh, so this is uh, number seven is one of the windows that is going to be replaced. This is something that um, that Peter was alluding to. This is the original aesthetic, which is 12 over two. This is what's there now, which is 12 over one. We are going to be restoring this window back to 12 over two so that these windows look the same. But you're replacing both of them. Nope. Uh, just the first floor. So the mass save heat loan is only for 25,000. So I, uh, with that and the Marvin high end windows, I'm only able to replace three apartments. So okay. unfortunately, this apartment will not be replaced yet, hopefully one day. This is the street facing window um, that is two over one. I believe that it was originally two over two. This is just a, a screen that's there. Um, this is the other, so both of these windows are the ultimate signature line wood clad windows that are being replaced. Uh, that's the replacement window. This is going to be wood. This is street facing. This is going to be replaced with a two over two, which is in keeping with the original design of the building. And this is that window. Um, it is under an overhang, um, as you can see. Uh, this is one of the sets of vinyl windows. Uh, I can see if I can. It is actually a green vinyl window. I don't know how it was approved, um, but it was like that when uh, we got the building. So. So this is just a view of the windows that can be seen from the street. Um, the next picture will show, uh, so this is the first floor. As you can see, there's plastic on the windows. It looks, it, it strays from the original aesthetic of the building to have the plastic on the windows, uh, uh, aesthetic of the window. So uh, the first two windows that are in way of view, this is the fifth and the sixth and the third and the fourth window that are in way of view and are going to be replaced. On the other side of the uh, building, this is the view from the street. This is uh, one of the seventh window that's going to be replaced. It's gonna be replaced with wood clad. This is the eighth window that's gonna be replaced with the elevate line. This is the ninth window. And again, this is the 10th window. Um, this is a better view of the green vinyl uh, windows on the third floor. Um, and these are the vinyl windows in the basement. I may be able to show you actually the vinyl windows on the third floor. Uh, you can kind of see them right over here. These are vinyl windows, but let's see if I can get, uh, it's really hard with this street view. This is a vinyl window. So uh, 
yeah, it's it's a little bit difficult to see, but this is a vinyl window. There are three vinyl windows here. There are three on the left side of the building, and there is one in the rear of the building that it, that is vinyl. Okay, great. Um, uh, Steve and Barbara and Greg, do you have any other, and is there anything else you'd like to see or hear from the applicant before we uh, go on to discussing this? Any more visuals or... You've seen everything you need to see. I have. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so we are trying to um, consider this project uh, to see whether we can award a certificate of appropriateness. And if that's not something we agree on, we consider um, a, a hardship, um, a hardship exception. And I just wanted to review with everybody, and I know Greg, you're sort of new at this, so uh, this probably will be more uh, enlightening to you. The rest of us know this. Um, we are going by the guidelines, which are in this handbook that was uh, put out by the Historical Commission that guides our decisions for the Elm Street and Brown Hill areas. And I just wanted to review with everyone uh, the criteria that we look at for replacement windows. Um, first of all, it's we always try to look at whether these could be repaired at all. And that's one question I have for you, but I'll hold off on that. Um, but if the replacement windows do need to be um, installed, these, this is what we look for. Um, one is that the replacement windows shall be all wood or cloud with metal exteriors and of the same dimensions for muntins, frames, sash, rails, and styles, and be of the same design meaning the number of panes, et cetera, to the original window. Uh, openings should not be reduced or enlarged to accommodate stock sizes and shapes. The complete replacement of all windows in a building in which only a few are in disrepair will not be approved. That's not under consideration here. Um, glazing should be limited to the following, either insulating glass or single glass with removable energy panels. The divided light options, meaning the munchen bar, should be limited to authentic divided light or simulated divided light with a spacer bar between insulating glass. Unacceptable options for divided lights are uh, simulated divided light, meaning applied to the glass, grills between insulating glass or removable grills. Those are not acceptable. Narrow munchen bars that are that closely match existing munchen widths, we, we would like to see Munch and bars wider than seven eighths are not acceptable. And we do prefer wood, wood clad exteriors. Aluminum is acceptable. And I will just note that fiberglass is not yet something that we have uh, discussed as an amendment to the guidelines at this point. Does anybody have any, any other commissioners have any come up questions about that? Okay, assuming that you've looked at all the materials and you listened to the presentations, um, I'd like to open it up for um, comments from the commissioners. Barbara, do you wanna start? Yeah, actually, I do, I do have a question because I was a little confused by the presentation. These windows, um, is, is it Peter? Is that, that's your name? Who gave yes, the Peter. Window, Peter. That you were, um, it wasn't clear to me whether these are, being custom made because you said they were close to the original so i don't know whether they're being custom made or whether your stock sizes say of the, of no, the rails these, or the styles these why? are these are custom made to the 64th of an inch on but, each and every why, project. so why are you all but a lot of times you said they're close to the original why aren't they the same as the original because when you're putting when you're putting it um i was trying to emphasize the point of when you're putting a uh, replacement window in, you're setting a window within another window frame. Visible glass with, it, when I work with the National Parks uh, Commission, any historic district, it's usually visible glass is going to be the driving factor. So I was trying to say that when you're putting a frame within a frame, and when with this instance here, I was trying to emphasize what the difference was or point out what the difference was between the accepted extruded aluminum clad wood and fiberglass wood uh, interior units were so that we could look at what the visible glass dimension was a relationship from the sash opening to the edge of the glass would be. 
short of if you're putting in replacement that there's no way that you can meet everything exactly putting a replacement in it just can't happen okay well that that was my question okay i guess i got my answer any other any other questions barbara or comments um well i understand i mean the the uh presentation of jess's was very um well should we say dramatic because clearly she needs to do something about these windows and i'm not happy to hear that the bass save will not support that their grants or loans cannot be used for repair of windows um, because you know again it's something we encourage and it's something that is really preferable for an historic window and a store an older house but i also realize that we now um and I know the windows do look like they're in horrible, a lot of them that you showed us are in very bad condition, but I'm wondering if there was some sort of survey or assessment done to see if any of those windows could be repaired, regardless of whether Mass Save would, I mean, I know that Mass Save won't fund that, but I just wanted to know what, if there had been an assessment of that, of the possibility of repairing some of those windows, um, instead of replacing them. Sure. Um, there has not been an assessment, um, but um, I can just speak to um, the the repair. Um, so if the windows are repaired, they would still need a storm window and storm windows have a smaller glass opening, which will change the original historic aesthetic look of the windows. And I think that that's an important note to be aware of. Um, in addition, um, the specified replacement windows are more in line with the historic preservation of the existing window than a storm window would be. And to repair a single pane window with a single pane window, which I'm not able to fund, I would have to put storm windows on per mass law uh, for rental apartments. So, um, and to repair the existing single pane with single pane would still require plastic to be put on the interior of the windows. And the plastic looks ugly and it can be seen from the exterior and it is a detriment to the historic aesthetic. So to me, it just feels like trying to repair these existing single windows is, is not in line with, um, with uh keeping with the beautiful aesthetic of the original windows as much as a replacement window would be barbara any more questions comments those are great questions and i had the same some of the same so uh not right now i'm, I'm good for now all right steve um, I guess I just have one uh, question for Sarah or maybe for Jess or both, and it has to do with these code requirements that um, apply to multifamily buildings. Is this Northampton code or is it something that comes from state state regulation about multifamily properties? Okay. Um, and do we know anything about how they're applied to historic buildings within local historic districts or... Um, is there any guidance in that regard that we have available to us? I mean, because it seems to have sort of two, well, we actually have three or four competing uh, things going on here to, to consider. Um, the health and safety of the occupants and the, our charge is very limited, right? We, we're asked just to think about the historic resource. Um, so I'd be interested in some more um, information about that if and when that's available. But I guess I just put out on the table, there's two, or two issues as I see it. One is that historic preservation guidelines are always focused on the original materials. So any removal of an original feature, um, sometimes referred to as a character defining feature of the building is considered a loss to its historic character. So um, that's, it's just hardwired into the way um, the preservation field has developed. So, um, that there's a value in maintaining that old stuff, the real, the real old thing, um, more than the aesthetic look. So that's that's kind of one issue as I see it. And then the second one, which we I think we talked about a lot already, is the compatibility of the new. Um, if you um, 
need to put something in new? Is it compatible with the historic? And I guess my way of thinking about that would be to look to what, you know, what is the historic resource? How do we understand it? And the form B um, identifies it as a Queen Anne building. And so um, in 1895, somewhere between 1890 and 1895 is the date of construction. So um, windows that are compatible with that. And it, it seems like for my um, like limited knowledge of this and quick, quick research that um, Queen Anne uh, windows were often quite simple in, um, and often um, double hung sash windows. So in some places where I think we've talked about a multi-light window, it may be that those themselves are replaced. Um, 1895 is a really long time ago. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, maybe there are some that were replaced in the 1930s or something like that. Um, so this question of what's original and what's not is on my mind as we're talking. But in any case, that the the significance of the resource is its Queen Anne architecture. So um, it may be that um, some cases, the simpler is the better um, as we think about compatibility. I don't know, Martha, do you have thoughts on that in terms of like some, I mean, the, the windows on the top look like they're probably replaced in the 80s, something like that before the district, but other windows throughout without being in the building and looking at them, you know, closely um, or bringing a window specialist in who knows historic windows. Right. Um, it does seem like some of these could be replacements in the 20s or 30s. So, um, and without historic, I mean, there's two ways to figure that out. One is historic evidence. You have plans or a photograph. The other is you have someone like a window repair specialist who can come out, do a visit, make an assessment, make some recommendations, give a quote on yeah. what it would cost to repair. And there are many people who do that work across the Commonwealth. Um, mm -hmm. And so that would be another you know resource to consult. Anyway, those are some of the things that are on my mind. Sort of three, three things: a multifamily issue. Um, how we think about original and then how we think about compatibility. Yeah, I think those are all really good, Stephen. Um, well, Greg, why don't you, if you have any thoughts and then I have a couple questions too, and then we'll ask the public to comment. Yeah, the only Greg, thought have I have is that uh, as I was reading Justice note that uh, they froze all winter and, you know, it's, it's historical windows uh, cannot measure up to today's standards and if people are freezing then i think the homeowner has a full right to replace them and um not freeze so the same yeah. if they're not you know historical windows have to single pane have to go away i that, that's a shame but cannot have people freezing in their homes yeah, and I, I think um, I had some of the same questions that all three of you did or comments um, and thoughts. Um, uh, just if you, is there a deadline for this mass save application? Um, I, I don't think there's a deadline, but I did apply for the loan about three months ago. So I don't mm -hmm. know how much longer they're going to keep it open for me. Um, it took this long to find the right windows, to find the millwork masters, to go through the different types. And it's just been such a long process. So I'm a little concerned that I might have to go through getting another audit in order to get another loan, um, which would really put us into another winter with these very, very cold, very inefficient drafty windows. Mm -hmm. So I can find out for you, there may be a deadline, um, but I, I just I, wanted I to yeah, I was just wondering if the program was, you know, had a termination date or something like that. Um, because I I do I do think that if these windows are actually original, that so they would make them like 130 years. I mean, they probably are made out of old growth forest or you know, hardwoods that um that are not used today, which is why windows deteriorate. A lot of windows deteriorate because they're, you know, not the whole old woods that were used way back when. Um but if they are original, you know, it would really be good to, it would be helpful, I think, for us to know how much deterioration there. I have to say the images that you showed, I've seen um, old windows that are in much worse condition than these. And, um, us, you know, sometimes they're repaired, sometimes they're not, but I, I didn't see 
the kind of deterioration that I've seen before where, you know, they're really beyond repair. But that said, you know, there's not, a, I, we didn't know a lot of detail of the photo in the photos and, and we didn't have a, um, a lot of different examples and obviously not detailed documentation of every window that's coming out. So um, that would be helpful. Um, so we're just gathering information here. Are there uh, members of the public who are present that would like to um, make comments or uh, share their thoughts about this? So I think we have some neighbors here. So Jen and Jeff. Um, I think, Greg, I think you're uh, having a conversation on the side, so please mute yourself. And then Jen and Jeff, if you want to unmute yourself. Sorry, I thought Greg was asking a question and I wanted to make sure he got his question in. I think he was on a different subject. Okay, so all right. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't want, to, didn't want to interrupt. Um, yeah. well, thank you, thank you. First of all, I want to say thank you to the Historic District. We are, in fact, the neighbors of Martha and of Jess, um, and we won an award from the Historic District for our renovation, um, and we're real, very proud of the work that we put into our house. Um, and uh, I think I'm just so impressed listening to Jess's presentation. Um, we are the neighbors, we'll be looking at these windows and she's taken such care with her house and such care I see working with Peter to find these windows that are going to be just such it feels to me uh, in the spirit of the historic district, um, such good matches. Uh, I've, you know, it has not been lovely looking at her plastic and we totally understand the reason for it. Um, and uh, so I, I really, um, I'm really happy to see this. I'm also really happy too. I know I, I, I work at a place right now that's really striving for carbon neutrality. And so I think most of all, I appreciate the fact that Jess is making a good faith effort to try to harmonize, you know, the spirit of the historic district with the reality that our climate's melting. And um, <laughs> that we like to save actually all of the history <laughs> and all of the earth. And this is probably the better way to do it. Um, I, I know that maybe shutters can work as well, but in terms of just, you know, raw energy loss, it seems like, um, it seems like uh, that this is the, the way to go. And so um, I'm, you know, again, it's it's really lovely presentation. And I am in the middle of cooking dinner for our kids and I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff, who I think has a couple of comments too. So thank you. Thanks. Hi. Uh, yes, thank you everyone. And I thought I had some comments to make, but Jen and I didn't compare notes before and it seems that we were mostly overlapping. So I'd just like to say, I support everything that Jen said, that we support Jess's application entirely and um, that we realize that the Historic Commission, as, as Stephen pointed out, has a very focused and specific mandate. And we feel like, you know, we recognize that, but we hope we would like to see the commission demonstrate that they like, can balance the environmental concerns with the historic concerns and not let perfect be the enemy of good. We think that justice application is terrific. And we would we would prefer that it go through for sure, but you know we'd or I should say we would appreciate it if uh, if her application were affirmed. Okay, great. Thanks, Jeff. Are there other members of the public that wanted to say anything? Emily, our Hi. former member for a brief yes. time. We miss um, you. <laughs> I'm a registered architect, and the reason I'm here is because of a question that was brought up tonight of what takes precedent, health and safety, energy code, or historic preservation, um, because that question was asked to me this week and I didn't know how to answer it. So um, I would assume that health and safety would come at, at the top. And I do feel that single pane windows are an issue. Um, they're not tempered. I saw many of those windows were near uh, stairs, which is a pretty significant um, public safety issue for occupants. And so the other thing just to add for energy, because I know the building commission is really pushing energy savings is that these old windows are function through weight cavities. And that's a very vulnerable portion of the building envelope that even if they're restored, it's just always going to be drafty at those things. So I thought there was a very thoughtful and historically um, respectful solution that they came up 
And then if they can fill in those uh, window wells, those cavities, it can make the occupant and the energy things work much more efficiently. So that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. Anybody else, member of the public? Okay. Uh, do the commissioners have any other thoughts? Um, and if not, do we want to make a mo there's make a motion now I just wanted to mention when I introduce this uh, we do have the option of um, issuing a certificate of hardship which would uh, count help um, cover our thoughts about um, you know there these our original windows that are being replaced and this, I can read you what the ordinance says. It's a very long, poorly worded uh, sentence, if you even want to call it that. Um, the ordinance specifies that a hardship can be issued if owing to conditions especially affecting the building or structures involved, but not affecting the historic district generally, failure to approve an application will inv involve substantial hardship, financial or otherwise, to the applicant and whether such application may be approved without substantial detriment to the public welfare, without substantial derogation from the intent and purposes of the historic district ordinance. So that, that is an option for us if we decide to turn down a certificate of appropriateness. So I would hear any uh, comments, more comments from the commissioners, or if someone wanted to make a motion based on all the evidence that's been presented, um, we could consider that. There are three of you there. I can't make the motion. Martha, could I could I possibly interject one other thing? Yes, you may. Um, yep. I don't know if you, if you wanted, uh, there was a project when uh, Jen and I were talking, uh, Jess and I were talking, excuse me, was, um, about using the fiberglass and all, we actually were, um, she had mentioned, I do a lot of work with either Nitrogen Power Services, various uh, historic commissions, et cetera. We actually did one in the historic district right in downtown Keene on their own building and utilizing the product that she is in. I did have some photos if someone wanted to see that in place of, of the Marvin Elevate product in a historic property actually owned by the historic commission or, or Cheshire County Historic Society but just put that out there if someone did want to see it with the fiberglass clad product instead of aluminum clad in place. Okay. Anybody? I appreciate the thought. I don't think it's really necessary if it's something we can look up online. My question for Jess is, is a hardship going to be beneficial to you or in a, if I missed this, I know it's late. Have you already been through that process? I have not been through the process of a certificate of hardship. It's been my understanding that a certificate of hardship would allow me to move forward with uh, trying to uh, get a building permit for the windows. And and so if if that does allow this project to move forward, then it would definitely be beneficial um, other than issuing a certificate of appropriateness, I am willing to take either uh, as long as, you know, myself and my tenants are not freezing cold next year. I, mm -hmm. I'm just going to be so excited. <laughs> so um, thank you for the for the question. And I hope that I answered it. Yes. Thanks. <clears throat> Steve or Barbara, do you have any other thoughts? I think we should, it would be good to hear a motion and we can um, deliberate on that if someone wants to formulate something. Okay. Well, I, I was going to say that I'm just, I'm not, you know, completely happy with the idea of these replacements and, but I, I would be willing to, um, so I would not want to issue a certificate of appropriateness, but I would just for the, for the sake of moving us along, I would, um, suggest a motion to offer a certificate of hardship for this project. Does someone want to second that? Greg or Steve? 
the problem, Martha, is um, I'm trying to see what's best for Jess. Um, and I understand what Barbara's saying, but that's not a simple, easy motion. And I'm a brand new person here. Um, I, I, I'm wondering if it could be worded differently, Barbara, uh, to say, you know, just have every right to pursue what she needs to do to, you know, I'm the realtor here. She, I'm the realtor here. She has, you know, home rights that if people are freezing cold, that she has the, every right to insulate the house. Um, so a straightforward motion, if you can understand what I'm saying, Martha, is how to word it. <laughs> so, Greg, that wouldn't really respect the um, the commission's charge with regard to the historic district. That's why the certificate of hardship process exists. So that, that would be the commission finding that, no, this doesn't strictly meet um, doesn't meet the ordinance, but you know, owing to conditions not affect, affecting the district as a whole, um, th this work can be allowed. Okay, fair enough. Can we have Barbara's uh, motion again? I was moving that we would issue the we could would issue is a certificate of hardship for this project for this application but not a certificate of appropriateness in lieu of that. So it needs to be seconded. We don't have a second, okay. Well, the other option would be to um, have a motion to um, issue the certificate and take a vote. That would be the other option. Since we can't get a second on Barbara's motion. Is anybody willing to do that? Greg, Steve? I think I, um, I, mean, I still see two issues here. One is that, you know, we have removal of original fabric from the building, which the design guidelines strongly discourage. Um, and we have um, some questions about uh, the compatibility of the new, although it seems like there's a lot of research that went into thinking about what those could be, but maybe still some concerns about fiberglass versus wood or other materials. Um, there are other ways to achieve um, safety uh, in terms of um, other approaches. And I think to consider hardship, we need to know what the relative cost of um, another plan of action would be if um, we got a quote, if the applicant got a quote for uh, window repair or another method. Um, we, do, we do, in fact, have a very narrow charge, which is to um, look out for the historic resources and try to balance that with the needs of the applicant. But I feel like we don't, we don't quite have enough information at this stage to do that. So um, those are the questions that are still in, still in my, my mind. I feel like if we had, you know, if we had window repair specialists that said, okay, it's going to be 35,000 to do this versus 25,000 for um, the other work, something like that, um, you would have a relevant means of comparison. And you know, as Martha, as you mentioned too, I don't know that we have the evidence that the windows are beyond repair, right? We they are clearly worn and damaged, and they're clearly major repair issues. Um, but the language of the, you know, it's in the staff report right here. The language of the design standards is beyond repair, and I don't, I don't know that we know that at this point. So, you know, I um, I'm sympathetic to balancing these concerns and thinking about how do you get window performance and soon. Um, but I also don't feel like I have the evidence to meet the letter of the requirements, which is beyond repair and and discouraged from removing original material from the building. So 
That's where I'm at. And I, I find myself um, certainly compelled by what Steve has said has made me really think more, more closely about this. So I would actually like to withdraw that motion okay. that I made. And I, I think Steve is right that we do need more information about whether these are really beyond repair and just what, I'm not gonna repeat everything he said, but, but just um, the sorts of information and um, assessments that he was calling for. Yeah, and that's certainly something we've asked for in the past. I think actually it was a few, a few doors uh, down uh, the brick house, and I don't remember the number of elements in the district where we did the same. We asked to have a window specialist, someone historic renew repair specialist, look at them before we made a decision. Um, so that's something that can be done, and we certainly could um, ask for that and table this for now um, and take it up at our next meeting. That would be another option as well. If we get the information sooner, do we have to wait a month or can we have a, another meeting in the meantime? If we were to table this right now and get some more information from Jess and I mean, I don't wanna put stuff off forever, but you know, it, it, I am very sympathetic to what she's going through, but you know, if we table for another month, um, can we have another meeting in the meantime? Uh, so I the, think the commission's next meeting is actually slightly sooner due to the right. Memorial Day holiday. So we'll be meeting the, the 22nd. Yeah, so it's like three weeks from now. So we could do that. Okay, three weeks doesn't seem like it's uh, going to make a hill of beans one way or the other. Um, if we were to table this and give more information. Okay. So just, um, this is not throwing the project out. This is something that is just collecting more information. And, you know, we have a responsibility to do this per the guidelines and per our charge. That's just part of being in the historic district. Um, the local district. And so it's not um, it's not saying to you, go away, we don't want to find a solution to this. It's it's just getting a little bit more information and I think it can be done. Um, it should be able to be done within in that length of time. So um, if that's something that the commissioners feel um, like is a good approach, someone should make a motion on that and then I think Sarah, you probably have some a window restoration specialist information that we can provide to Jess. Uh, we do, and we have some similar examples from that project that you had mentioned, Martha. So Jess, I'll be happy to yeah. talk with you about that. And do you feel like you have enough guidance from the commission about exactly what's necessary? Um, it sounds like you would like me to uh, engage with a restoration specialist to come and assess whether the windows are beyond repair or not. That's exactly right. And what the extent of the damage is and, and um, whether if they can be repaired, um, what the cost of that would be, um, whether you're going to achieve the energy requirements that you need. Like those are really hard questions to ask, you know, ask questions that need to be asked and addressed honestly by the repair person. And then we can make a decision. Okay. Yeah, um, I, if Sarah, if you could send me that information, I will gladly do that. Thank you. Okay, so we need another motion. So the, and the motion here would be to continue the hearing until 5.30 on May 22nd. Correct, yeah. I'll move that we continue the hearing until 5.30 on May 22nd. I'll second that motion. All right. So unless there's any discussion, we'll have Sarah um, take a vote. Right. Roll call. Roll call. Yes. Roll call. Yes. Steve? Yes. Barbara? Yes. And Martha? Yes. And don't forget Greg. He was first. Oh, <laughs> we didn't hear you. Okay. Great. So we'll look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. Thank you very much. And thank, thank you for you, hearing us. I appreciate it.
You're welcome. Thank you. All right, um, we next have on the agenda um, the proposed exterior restoration work um, to the 20 Hollis Street building. This is the former St. John Canius, now is going to be Holly Apartments. And this is being done um, because we are in the final stages of, uh, I should say the city is in the final stages of um, preparing the and finalizing the uh, uh, historic preservation restriction that's being placed on the building as a condition of the um, the project. Um, so that is what we're here to do. Now, I just want to say it is quarter of seven, and I know, Mark, <laughs> you've been waiting for a while. It looks like, Sarah, you're here too. Um, it's possible that we may need more time for this, just given how long that public hearing went. Um, and if that's the case, then um, we could continue this in a couple of weeks when we meet again, um, but we would we would like to um, hear your presentation about it. And I think we all got the drawings and um, it's a lot of information. So it would be nice to, uh, since you're here, to be able to hear your presentation about what you're doing there. And then if we need to continue, we will. Right. Um, well, thank you, Martha. Um, Sarah, is there anything that you'd like to start off with or you want me to just launch in? Um, no, just um, Mark is the, you know, the architect. So I'll let him kind of take the lead on what we're looking at doing for the, with the exterior of the building. Okay. Great. Thank you. So um, let's see, can I uh, share the screen? Is that something that I need permission to do? No, you should be all set. Okay. So I'll, uh, do you see the drawing now? Yes, we do. Yep. Okay. So, um, this is, uh, one of the drawings in the set. I'm just, uh, probably maybe the easiest um, to start with at any rate. Um, so the, and the exterior uh, facades of the building, um, as you realize, we're, we're both restoring the, the exterior um, in some ways, but also we have to make uh, some modifications to uh, accommodate the the new use within the building uh, in terms of the, the apartments. So to that end, um, we are doing uh, masonry restoration, which includes, um, you know, re some repointing of, of open joints. Uh, we have a few areas where we are rebuilding the brickwork. Um, and we have uh, basically repointing of all of the terracotta that's on the building. There are a few uh, terracotta elements that are uh, sort of beyond repair that would be uh, replaced with cast stone elements. Uh, and, I, and I can point those out in a little bit. Um, we have um, some new window openings. Uh, we are restoring uh, windows and we have, um, you know, on the roof, uh, we're replacing uh, the existing uh, roof uh, shingles that are there and we're doing restoration work on the sheet metal uh, cupolas and restoration work up on the uh, on the tower. So on this uh, facade here on the south elevation, um, one of the things that currently exists is a, a ramp that was added uh, later that uh, goes to the, the doorway at the tower. This will actually be removed and there will be a, a small stair which was there previously um, that will be recreated uh, because this will end up going to uh, an apartment which um, the, the door will be 
sealed, but you will you will see the door and you'll see the stairwell. Um, then on in that same apartment, um, and that apartment goes to you know in essence here, um, there'll be a new window opening that will be created that will be the same size as the adjacent uh, large windows. And, uh, you know, we'll also uh, do a similar uh, brick surround that is here and where we have currently uh, terracotta sills, we'll have a, a cast stone sill that will, in essence, look identical uh, to that. Um, on the on the front facade, um, you know, there'll be uh, very little um, change. The only thing, uh, again, uh, there'll be uh, some repointing work, uh, window restoration on the existing windows. Um, the, uh, the crosses would be removed at these two locations and uh, that metalwork uh, will be modified. Uh, let's see. This, this facade, which is not really public view any longer, uh, this faces the condominiums. Um, again, this has some areas where some significant um, water damage is causing us to rebuild some brickwork here. Um, and this area right here is going to become our accessible entrance. So we'll adjust the grade um, to this doorway and, you know, grade will come up here along these window, these three window wells will get filled in uh, over on this side. Um, again, um, the windows here, um, the original frames are being uh, kept, but the stained glass, which used to be in them are, uh, you know, were all removed many years ago. Um, we'll end up having new windows that, that fit into those frames and, and we'll show you what that looks like in a moment. Uh, we have all new gutters and downspouts. Um, the gutter uh, and eave along both sides is in uh, poor condition, uh, basically needs to be reconstructed. Actually, that was one thing that I forgot to mention here. With at right at the uh, front entrance, the the woodwork uh, in this area right here again is all rotted out. Um, basically, was uh, you know rebuilt uh, using plywood um, in the latter 20th century, which is now all rotted. So this area right here will get reconstructed. Uh, the same brackets and everything else um, will will look the same, uh, but it'll all be done in uh, red grandis, uh, you know, wood and then uh, painted. So um, it should have, you know, a hundred year lifespan uh, in, this, in its next go round. And on the back of the building, this is where um, we have, in essence, um, apartments at, at three levels here. This, these are going to be new windows and I'll, and I'll show you what those will look like in a moment. Um, uh, the reason that on the third floor, they sort of step in uh, from here is uh, because of some uh, brace framing uh, that, that requires it to do that. Um, but uh, other than that, the, the other change on this side, again, where we have a, uh, in essence, from the existing entrance to the basement. Um, and this is a uh, somewhat public, somewhat private um, view here. It, it doesn't get a lot of um, view from the street, sort of a bleak angle that you would see. Uh, but from this point here is where the ramp will start up and, and go to that, that handicapped access uh, point in the back. This little um, basement access uh, way. This actually is a is a very short door. It's only a little, 
only about five feet high. This will actually come up. And this one window right here, uh, which is existing, this, this window will get modified so that it's shorter. Uh, all the other existing windows uh, basically get uh, restored. So let me go to... So here's uh, the roof plan. Um, this is all going to end up being, uh, you know, uh, new shingles in, in this area and on, on the two apps and over the sacristy. This area back here, um, this will be a new uh, sheet metal uh, batten roof. Um, again, this uh, will be restored. Uh, there'll be a new um, stone cap uh, put on the on the chimney back here. This area, this little cricket area over here, is uh, going to be uh, new flat seam copper. And at this point, um, we're assuming there is only limited uh, repairs needed for this uh, tower roof, which is the um, where the Spanish tile uh, is is located. So then, see so while you're moving it, can you remind us the material for the roof that's there now? Uh, it is a slate roof right now, but it's in yeah. poor condition. Uh, so when you the, said shingle, you're going to be replacing the shingle. Is it asphalt shingle? Correct. So the intent is it, it's a red slate shingle roof now, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the intent is to um, you know, go back with a, uh, a red um, asphalt shingle roof. So mm -hmm. this is what what is, you know, you can see currently uh, the condition. Mm -hmm. And let me see if I can get up to, this is the, uh, the red shingle that is uh, being proposed. And I think we had, um, Sarah, that uh, shingle board that we had provided, um, did that go to Sarah LaValle? Um, it did not. I can bring it over. It's... Oh, okay. So we do have a, a sample board, um, but in essence, you know, this is what the appearance is from, from a distance. Mm -hmm. Uh, it would be, it would not be the scallop shingle though. It would be the, uh, uh, that shingle there. Okay. So you. let me go back to, 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 to um, so this, again, this would be copper work, uh, done at, um, both where, where the, uh, crucifixes are at, at the moment. Um, this would basically be uh, restored back here, the distance. All you the door. The, oh. You mentioned the crucifixes are coming off. Are they going back on at some point, or? No, it, it's it's basically meant to, you know, just do something like that with it, where it's just basically a, a ball there. Yeah, I just um, I just was curious as to whether the church would allow that, but yeah, okay. Um, so this is what the the new windows um, in essence would look like so this is the new window here um, and because the apartments have two levels the floor level in essence is is along that line typically it doesn't go in front of these two windows here but um, all of these higher ones it does so there will there'll be an upper and lower sash with a, uh, a spandrel panel that, that goes in between. Um, and that way that's, that's where the floor of the apartments, the, the second floor of the apartments comes into. Um, I, I, I hate to interrupt, but I, I wanna ask a question why we're looking at a specific uh, facade, because all the way on the left, the new window that you're putting in, I, I see it has a surround, but it's not having the 
big arch that the other five windows have on that. I mean, I maybe there's not room for that big an arch, but there's no there's no detailing planned Correct. like that planned uh, for that window. Yeah. So the detailing. see if I can there is brick detailing around the window um, the way that let me see I can get to another photo here um, so what we're doing is we're we're recreating this here so that this plane you know you you can see how the how the window sets back the the difficulty is you know we can't really do this brickwork when we go back to the because all of this brick is out one course from this brickwork right so you know, it, it's it's not exactly apples and apples, but it's like the best that we can, um, you know, and to make this appear correct. Right, right, um, right. And and this is the facade that faces. Um, it's not Philip's place. Um, uh, yeah, it is. Maybe it place. is. Yes. Yeah. Maybe it is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. This is facing Philip. Philip's yep. place. Um, and let's see what I sort of believe. Um, these, these are, um, this is the, the rear elevation. This is where new windows are being added in. So, like I said, all of the, all the existing windows are being restored and the way that, um, you know, the, these windows, in essence, will get um, vacuum glass. So, um, you know, it's two layers of, of glazing, um, but, you know, it's, it's still very thin. Um, and so we can get it into the same frame. We do need to add additional weight into the pockets to be able to to accom accomplish that, but we can get a uh, a pretty good um, U value on, on those windows uh, by doing that. So that's how that's how we're dealing with uh, the the existing uh, windows, uh, both uh, both there and you know, on the, on the larger windows, uh, like we see here. Are you still looking at, right now there's a photograph of the tall window. Are you seeing that? Yes, we are. Okay, all right. Um, so, and, and the, so in this instance, um, you know, where the, where the floor in essence goes through, you know, this is where there'll be a, a spandrel panel right here and then you'll have a, a top and bottom window um, mm -hmm. as we saw in, in right here. Um, then on on the on the rear, um, these will be uh, single hung uh, sash. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, there'll be um, aluminum clad uh, wood windows. We'll still have uh, a, uh, a cast stone sill, and then we would have uh, brick uh, headers over them. This one window right here, uh, which actually is within a, uh, a bathroom, because this basement access you know, gets raised to that point, that would just become a, uh, a little casement uh, window, um, still utilizing the same profiles and everything uh, that, that are there. Um, on this side, this is um, 
the side that faces the condominiums. This is where the ramp comes up in the back um, and will provide access, uh, you know, accessible access to uh, the building. Um, and that looks like that's here. So the grade will get raised up in here. Right now it's become a sort of pit almost because um, there's a fairly steep little hill right here behind the condominiums. Um, so this, this area is tending to get uh, filled. Uh, you know, it has a couple of yard drains and everything else, but you know, if they get clogged, you know, it's going to be a mess anyway. So I think that becomes a very, uh, frankly, a, a good solution to raise. And, and this will be uh, waterproofed along the, the foundation here, uh, but it'll provide access directly uh, into uh, the building at this location. And these areas right here, um, this actually already is asphalt shingle. Um, this has been replaced uh, a number of years ago right here. And the area that's being, uh, two of the areas that are being rebuilt in terms of brickwork are, are these locations. You can see all the staining. There was, there was a lot of water damage in these areas. So uh, that brickwork is going to have to be uh, completely uh, taken back um, one course and, and reconstructed. Uh, so, do, do, do. Um, gutter details, you know, we're actually slightly increasing the, the gutter size, uh, because it's woefully undersized at the moment, which has caused some problems for the building. Um, and frankly, with the, uh, larger and larger, uh, rainfalls, um, it, it's really crucial that that be, um, uh, increased. Uh, we have some of the, this roof here um, is over that entrance where I said the uh, uh, area was going to be uh, rebuilt. Uh, this, this roof here uh, will also be um, reconstructed uh, and that, that'll also be a, a flat seam, uh, well, it'll be a batten uh, roof. Um, and here, you know, there's only, there's only about a half a dozen or so um, terracotta pieces that are in really bad shape that are beyond repair. Um, things like this are are being patched, but this this particular element right here, um, this would be replaced uh, with a piece of uh, precast um, or cast stone. Uh, you would think of it so. Um, it will look, you know, virtually identical to, to what the terracotta looked like, which in essence was trying to look like uh, limestone to start with. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, let's see. Um, these are some of the details for, uh, you know, reconstruction of these brackets. Um, that are damaged on on the front of the building. Um, the the metalwork um, is actually a combination of two different um, things. We have um, galvanized metal, which was painted um, so that it would again look like terracotta, look like you know um, you know stonework. That will remain as such. And then we also have areas that, well, I say remain as such. It, the, the bad areas will be replaced with uh, new, uh, you know, galvanized painted uh, sheet metal. Where uh, it was copper, it'll go back as copper. Where we can keep the existing copper, we're doing that. Um, the this is this is that basement area way that I was referring to in the back, which has a very short door, uh, just simply to make this useful. This will get 
heightened that one window um, will become a little casement window, which is within the bathroom. And, you know, right now the roof on this is in sad shape. Um, that's a, a flat seam metal roof and it, it will go back with a flat seam metal roof. Um, these are some of the details for uh, the new steps that will be facing Phillips uh, at the base of the tower where um, currently there's a, a ramp uh, that goes there. So that door um, doorway will have, you know, again, just a small stair with a, uh, you know, brick cheek walls. Uh, so it'll, it'll look like it did, um, you know, historically. Uh, this is, these are, are the various window types. Um, we're not doing, <clears throat> excuse me, we're not doing too much on the uh, rose window at the moment. Um, we're, we're simply pointing the, um, the, the open joints in the terracotta, but um, we're not doing a tremendous amount of work here. Um, trying to keep that work uh, limited at the moment. Here we can sort of zoom in a little bit on the, um, these are the windows that, uh, you know, where the stained glass uh, once was, that's, you know, been long removed. This is where the spandrel panel will be. This will all be wood. It'll be all be painted wood. Um, the, uh, there'll be a double hung sash at, at the bottom and then uh, at the second floor because you know your floor level is is close here this will be a fixed pane with just the the top sash uh, being able to come down here's some of the the details on the so this is actually the existing um, window frame uh, right here. And, you know, to be able to, um, you know, put the new, new sash in, you know, we'll just simply modify that on the interior uh, and then add, you know, some additional stops and uh, sash on the interior. But from the exterior, um, all the profiles will be the same. In fact, it'll be the same wood, actually. Um, uh, the doors <clears throat> all being uh, restored. The, um, the only difference uh, will be is where um, some of the lights uh, will end up uh, in this instance, you know, all the top lights will be glass. Currently, there's like five panes that are glass. Uh, and then some of them will actually become solid because this is uh, this is into the tower, um, you know, and it's not going to be a used door. So currently, there's there's some top lights, but this this will end up getting filled in. Um, but otherwise, the, the doors for all intents and purposes will look the same. Uh, from the outside. And I think that's about it. Like I said, there's, um, you know, some terracotta work that is being um, restored at, at the top, you know, in terms of uh, cracks you know, this will be epoxy repaired, um, but <clears throat> we're not we're not replacing uh, sections of the terracotta up here. We're basically stabilizing everything uh, at at this time. So, is there? I'm sure that there's more that I can speak to, but do folks have questions? Well, Mark, yeah, Mark. Thank you so much. That was very helpful to have a detailed overview of this. Um, I guess I would ask, it's 7.15, and I want um, Stephen Barber to 
and Greg to weigh in on whether they would like to have some time to review all of this in their um, at their leisure uh, in the next three weeks and come back to it because we need to vote on this. Um, you know, vote on our endorsement of it um, so that 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 can be um, uh, trans transferred to mass historical. So um, are, are people feeling like about it? Do they want, do you want some more time to think about it? Um, have a discussion? I, um, I have one quick question, but then I agree. I was uh, thinking about it today and trying to understand the agenda item. So we have a preservation restriction, which I haven't read. We have a historic structures report, which I haven't read. We have um, plans. And now a presentation. It's a lot of material. And then mm -hmm. thank you for my past experience about if you're going to review plans and try to make a finding that something meets the standards, you want to do your due diligence and be attentive to it. So I really appreciate the detail in the presentation. A lot of the questions I had mm -hmm. um, were covered. And um, I think just one, one quick question, which is that in the notes in the beginning, it refers to cleaning. And I wonder if you could say um, how you're thinking about approaching um, the cleaning of the building? So, the, I mean, the cleaning, uh, we'll do some test cleaning to start with, but in essence, it's going to be, you know, the gentlest means possible. I mean, uh, it'll uh, probably just be a, uh, uh, you know, water uh, soaking to start with and, and see what we can get, but we'll have to do some uh, test samples on the building. Uh, and <clears throat> I mean, that, that's really going to be necessary before we do any of the pointing, uh, because, uh, you know, we don't want to be, we don't want to be matching, you know, new mortar to dirty old mortar. Uh, you know, we want it to, to match and everything else. So that'll, that'll all come into play. Uh, and, and there are specifications, uh, you know, for all of this work as well. So, um, you know, uh, again, it'll, it'll be the gentlest means possible, but we'll be out there, you know, working with the contractor to, to look at that as, as it happens. Great. Yeah, that's, that's, that's great. Thank you. And, and I think I agree with Steve that ha having, say, uh, the structural report or the assessment of the conditions might be helpful in understanding why why the entire slate roof is going to be taken off and replaced with asphalt because that's a a huge thing um, and a big difference. So um, I don't you know feel necessarily feel comfortable with that without some more information about that. Okay. So would it be? We have the HSR. Yeah. Yeah, the, the HSR is is there. We also have also been up on the lift uh, after the HSR was completed to take a, a much better look at, you know, what the uh, roof conditions are. And, you know, the, uh, the, the number of deteriorated slate is, you know, you, you, everything would have to be taken off at any rate. It's, it's not at this point sort of a piecemeal uh, you know, kind of thing that, that could be put back, uh, and it would just some minimal repairs. Um, it, it's beyond that. Um, we would certainly be, uh, open if, um, you know, I don't know if you have a workshop session actually would want to see the building on site. We could certainly do that if that would be helpful to, uh, you know, move the, project forward at the next meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a possibility. It's not something we normally do, but if people feel like that would help be helpful to them, we can, I think we're open to that, right, Sarah? Wouldn't we be open to that, something like that? Yeah. It would have to happen in the next um, three weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think okay. that would be very, very helpful. Matt. Okay. <laughs> You know, a question I'm weighing here is, you know, thinking about what are the, as I look at the rear elevation, for instance, right, sort of thinking about that as a, as a tertiary, right, not mm -hmm. the primary from the front or even the secondary, but the tertiary facade so that, you know, to make um, a new use, you know, a dramatic new use, a very different use possible, um, 
and and do a rehabilitation treatment, right? How do we think about rehabilitation um, as the treatment under the standards that um, it does allow for some changes, but trying to balance that and then getting a better sense of that through looking at the plans and then a site visit would be would be great. So yeah, okay. thanks. Chris, if we could arrange that, that would be great. Um, did someone else have a question, Barbara? No, Greg? No, okay. Do we need to vote to, uh, to delay this, Sarah? Uh, no, that can just be an understood okay. up at the next meeting and agreed that you'd like me to set up a site visit. I think that would be really useful. Yeah. Okay. Um, so maybe, yeah, send out a poll to see when people okay. are available. Um, and obviously we would want to do it in the daylight. <laughs> There's more of it these days. Than <laughs> there is a lot more of it, yes. <laughs> Um, okay, that sounds great. And then we'll plan to um, continue this at the May 22nd meeting. And uh, I think at that time, we should have enough information and have had enough time with the information to um, make a, you know, take a vote on it. If there's any questions in the interim or anything we can answer, just let us know. Um, and then, Sarah, if you want to reach out to me, you know, we're pretty open. We can set up a time to meet okay. out there. Sounds good. Great. And I don't know if um, all the members of the commission noticed, but the um, I did include a link to some additional materials in the public filing cabinet. And one of those was the, the draft preservation restriction. And we're down to elements with mass historic, literally like the, the order of the exhibits and, and the, the format of the notary book. Okay. So there, there's nothing of substance. Uh, it's just making those those final corrections before we- yeah, I, I apologize, I didn't see that. Yeah, and I thought I, I took look a look at, at that. Things, yeah. yeah, the B exhibit I thought was would is really um because it's a long document. The B exhibit I think is really useful um because it's a set of guidelines for the restriction and defines major and minor repairs. So something that um we need to be cognizant of. Okay, great. All right. Well, um Mark and Sarah, thank you so much. Thank you. And we'll see you, you in a few weeks. We'll see you before, hopefully. All right. Um, we we do have a few more items. I'm suggesting that we move those to the next meeting um, because it is late. And I don't believe the Northampton New Haven Canal documentation is urgent. It's not. So, okay. Um, uh, we, Claudia, do you have one more comment? Your hand is up. Yes, sorry. I just wanted to ask if you could make the meetings around the Barrett group uh, hybrid meetings that we would be people could zoom in and also have it in person. I feel like they really add the community contact adds to the value of the meeting. So just to say that before you leave, thanks for the meeting. It's been very interesting. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right. Um, and I know uh, before we Go on. it's very late. Um, Steve, I know you had been advocating for trying to get back together. Um, I get, I was told that the pandemic is gonna be over on May 9th. That's what everyone, you know, that's the, right, just happens, you know, that morning it's over. Um, so we can talk about that. Uh, at the moment, I am not able to attend live meetings because I'm on crutches and I can't get to them, um, but I'm hoping that will change. So I'm hoping it won't go on forever. So uh, having the uh, Zoom meetings has been essential for me for the last couple of months. So, uh, but we can reconsider that if everyone's in favor of it. All right, um, if, if there's nothing else, I'm going to do, uh, I would motion a, a turn a motion to adjourn. So, so moved. Okay. All right. I'll say goodbye. Okay. And we all say goodbye. Okay. Thanks very much everyone. Bye. Bye.